Well, we're in First Chronicles, chapters 10 through 13. And by way of just a quick summary review, the word in the Hebrew really means the words concerning the days is the Hebrew title. Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible is counted as one book. That's a, a reckoning in which makes 22 books in the Tanakh, which is the same number of the Hebrew letters. In the Greek translation, the Septuagint, they really call it the Greek term for supplements because the Septuagint translators regarded Chronicles, both first and second, as a supplement to uh, Samuel and Kings, especially first and second Kings. So if you're going to review uh, our lessons as you go, it's a good time to skim through your notes from especially uh, Second Samuel uh, on. Uh, in the Latin Vulgate picks up on that, in the, in the Latin call it Chromicon, it's from that we get our English, if you will. But First and Second Kings really represent a political record. First and Second Chronicles represents a religious record. The focus of Chronicles will be the Davidic dynasty. They, they'll have a few, we'll have just a little picture of the death of Saul, but we jump right into David, what made him great. Uh, they gloss over his shortcomings because the real focus isn't measuring him. It's to establish the dynasty and the history of the uh, th southern kingdom. So uh, they take the form of a history. They commence, strange enough, they commence with Adam, really, as you probably discovered when we went through chapter 1, wading through those genealogies, all the way uh, through the death of Saul, with only a few fragments in there. They finally end, the book, the, the second chronicles, they end with the decree of Cyrus of Persia when, the, when Babylon is conquered and they're released to go back home, when the exile is over, in other words. So this takes us all the way through to the exile. And David and Judah are the primary focal points with a lot of emphasis on the priestly and Levitical aspects because it's, that's why in many respects you can view it as a religious history of the southern kingdom. And uh, the genealogy of the first nine chapters, the rest of First Chronicles will deal with the reign of David himself from chapters 10 through 29. Second Chronicles pick it up with the reign of Solomon and it will carry it on for about 425 years through the whole Davidic dynasty. And uh, the northern kingdom had 21 dynasties, the southern kingdom had one, the, 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 the dynasty of David. And uh, so if you timeline this as we did and learned the Bible in 24 hours, you recognize this timeline here from Samuel to Saul to David to Solomon. And when Solomon dies, there's a civil war, southern kingdom, northern kingdom. The northern kingdom splits off goes from bad to worse and gets wiped out by the Assyrians, 722. But the southern kingdom can, has a few exceptions of bad, many bad kings, but a few exceptions. But they end up going, not, not being wiped out, but going into exile for 70 years. Not that they didn't deserve it, but God had made a commitment to David. That's the only thing that really saved them. That's why they had only a 70-year exile. They weren't wiped out. They were allowed then to return to the very day, by the way, that Jeremiah had predicted. And so First and Second Samuel covers right up to the uh, reign of Solomon, and First Kings and Second Kings carry it right on to the exile. And um, they split. First and Kings they split between Elijah and Elisha, basically. The Book of Chronicles, First Chronicles parallels Second Samuel in a sense, and Second Chronicles will cover it from First Kings to the end of Second Kings, but from a different point of view. So Chronicles is like a supplement in a sense. There's there are many duplications, but in large measure, Chronicles is a, uh, a uh, very, uh, it has an agenda to um, uh, present uh, the, the Davidic dynasty. So, First and Second Samuel, you may, you may want to review your notes for this general study. Uh, and then uh, First and Second Kings, David's 40-year reign in Jerusalem. And then uh, Solomon, the divided kingdom, and so forth. And... Uh, so, and Second Chronicles will be a recap. So, and First Samuel, Samuel was the last of the judges, and uh, he, he, the First Samuel he focuses on Saul, uh, a promising beginning, but obviously later folly and sin, and then that sets the stage for David. Many people assume that Saul was a response. That the reason they have a king is because they were screaming for a king, so God reluctantly let him have it. Um, that's, not, that, that's, a, un, that's, an, that's an uninformed perspective. David was prophesied long before they begged for a king. His genealogy is outlined in Genesis 38, encrypted behind the text, strangely enough. It's also laid out in the book of Ruth. So David was destined to be king. So they're, they're screaming for, they just, uh, Samuel, uh, or God, through Samuel, gave them uh, uh, what they asked for. You always got to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> 
And uh, he, sa- he looked good, sound good, but it was a big mistake. In any case, uh, last part of 1 Samuel, he, David gets anointed, and he starts, and he, of course, is a fugitive under Saul, and all those adventures constitute 1 Samuel. But then you get to 2 Samuel, you get his triumphs. He, was, he ruled for seven years at Hebron among just two tribes, the Judah and Benjamin. And, uh, but God really counts his kingship from the time that he's king of all Israel. And uh, so he will be at Jerusalem 13 subsequent years after that. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that in, in, in our chronicle study. In the book of Samuel, it continues with David's trouble in his family and in the nation. He makes a mess of things in many respects. He's, they're not just the sin of Bathsheba, there's several other issues. But as a result of all of that, his family is a mess. And uh, so... Uh, Chronicles will gloss over that because it's really got a different agenda. It's looking at the, the kingdom as a whole. So we went through the first nine chapters from Adam to Jacob, Jacob to David, David to Zedekiah, and the tribal appointments in those genealogies that opened the book. But uh, we're now in the second section of First Chronicles, and uh, we're going to deal with David's reign at Jerusalem. Even the Hebron thing is sort of glossed over as far as the Chronicle writers are concerned. If you visualize the chroniclers as Levites or priests and so forth, you, it, it, you'll get that feel, you, you get the feeling that they write about what's important to them, not necessarily doing a balanced overall picture. They're really trying to profile a, a, a Levitical perspective. Okay, so let's just jump in with chapter 10. It's the only chapter in Chronicles dealing with Saul. It's sort of just starting with, uh, by cleaning up the past here, so to speak. Saul had early promise, good-looking, sharp, solid, many respects, striking physical superiority. He was modest at first, direct, generous, but then he declines. He gets to be very irreverent, very presumptuous, and very willful, and gets himself, goes from bad to worse. He ends up being disobedient to God's instructions, indulges in deceit. He fails to destroy the Amalekites, If he had done what he was told to do, there never would have been a Haman in the book of Esther because he's a direct descendant of the person that Saul was supposed to kill. And his career sort of climaxes, if I can use that phrase, um, with consulting the witch at Endor, that bizarre thing. And, of course, the witch is shocked because Samuel does really show up, apparently. And um, uh, she sees it. He only hears him. Samuel predicted, you'd never see me again after this day. So we, there's some technicalities that are very provocative. But in any case, uh, and it points out that, by the way, Saul, tomorrow you're going to be with me. <laughs> so so uh, uh, that next day, of course, Saul and his, and his son is, are, are, are killed. So let's jump in. First Chronicles 10, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, Abinadab, Malchishua, and the, son, the, you know, the sons of Saul. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded of the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. That's a tough spot to be in. Your king, your boss, wants you to help uh, kill him, and he refuses. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul died, and his three sons and all his house died together. So that's the dismal tale. Now, we're not going to get into this here particularly from an exam point of view, but if somebody asks you who killed Saul, it gets to be quite a debate because David in 2 Samuel is, counters an Amalekite who claims he killed him, and he takes credit for having killed Saul, creating the impression that Saul was trying to kill himself and didn't, that, so the Amalekite took care of it. And it was, the Amalekite was a little shook because David probably didn't believe him in the first place, but didn't matter if he's claiming that he killed the king, then he's a dead man, and he was. So he kills the Amalekite. And, uh, but according to the scripture, then, 
If you take the scripture seriously, you have to end up believing the Malachite was just making that story up. Because here, it clearly confirms that Saul killed himself, if you will. Not, it's not a big deal, but uh, uh, it'll never surprise you to find the things that, uh, that uh, commentators find to argue over. The most trivial textual emanations, and, and they usually don't have anything to do with doctrine, but they'll you know, write PhDs, theses, and stuff, deciding how to split hairs and so forth. Okay. And when all the men of Israel that were in the valley saw that they fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, then they forsook their cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. The big disaster time here. It came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And when they had stripped him, they took his head and his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. Bad times. This is, these are dark days for them. Now, first, the first 12 verses here of First Chronicles 10 are almost identical to First Samuel 31, for those of you that are paying attention to that part of it. And... Uh, now, Chronicles adds the detail that his head was fastened in the temple of Dagon, um, but it omits the fact that they hung his body on the wall at Beth Shon. That's going to come up here in a minute. But this, this Dagon idol is something that we want to f refresh ourselves on a little bit because I want to take you on a review shortly about some other issues. But Dagon, uh, they... they um, have found evidence, archaeological evidence, that he was worshipped before 2000 B.C. So very early, he was a storm god, a sea god in various forms, also related to grain or fertility, if you will. And uh, because dag is a fish, but daga is to multiply or increase and grow. And so there's some, some cross-linkages there. He is regarded in their, in their world as the father of Baal. And uh, he's sometimes represented as a half-man, half-fish, sometimes a half gal, too, so you get the mermaid thing derives from this sometimes. But by the Phoenicians and the Philistines, uh, the seacoast tribes there. And uh, he's typically, in the temples they find, uh, at Gaza, Ashdod, Bethshan, uh, Beth Dagon in Judah, and Joshua 15 and Asher, and also at Nineveh. So he gets around. The fact they find him at Nineveh, by the way, gives you an insight that you probably will not find in the book of Jonah because they generally assume that Jonah survived the, the big fish thing, but probably bleached albino. But whatever, those are conjectures by various scholars, but his going through Nineveh with a message, having survived the fish, may have gotten their attention because of their worship of Dagon. There's a linkage there that's not obvious from the book of Jonah that uh, seems to be justified from archaeological evidence. Who knows? We'll see. But... Um, We'll come back to Dagon uh, before this evening's over on, on another reflection here. But let's move on now. Verse 11, And when all Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistine, what the, all that the Philistines had done to Saul, they arose, all the valiant men. See, earlier Saul had done Jabesh Gilead some major favors. And so they felt, even though he's dead, they felt an allegiance to him in that sense. So they arose all the valiant men and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the oak at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Glib little verse, but doesn't really get across the fact that these were valiant men. They probably took great jeopardy in going to Beth Shan to, get the, to recover the bodies to give it a decent burial. And so that's a testimony to their regard, if you will, of Saul. So the chronicle continues, so Saul died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord. Get the point here. See, the chronicler is giving you an editorial comment here. Saul died, not because the Philistines killed him. He died for his transgressions, which, which he committed against the Lord. And what were those transgressions? That's a great exam question. He failed to kill the king of Agag, and he consulted the witch at Endor, just for starters, there's a lot of others. Even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So there's the witch of Endor issue coming up. 
and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. That's a quick editorial summary by the chronicler himself. I want to alert you to that. In the book of Chronicles especially, as we go through history, you'll see little verses inserted that reflect an opinion that, in effect, is the opinion of God about the... See, you can say, why, how, why was Saul killed? Well, the Philistines killed him. No, he died because he transgressed against the Lord. And that's not, that's not a Chuck Missler opinion or whoever. This is a chronicler's opinion. And we're going to discover when we get to Chronicles 35 a couple of verses that have been overlooked by most scholars that will really unravel, probably, some of the biggest mysteries of the Ark of the Covenant. So when we get there, I'll hold that out to you. It's going to be kind of fun when we get there because the Ark of the Covenant has a history that's documented that everybody's overlooked. It's documented in Second Chronicles 35 as well as archaeological evidence that we've been able to find, discover. So we'll talk about that as we go along. In any case, David's on the, on the scene now, so that brings us to chapter 11, the reign of David. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. To get the picture, you need to understand the politics here. He had been ruling in Hebron for seven years, but just over two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, which are loyal to him personally. But now what's happened is then all Israel gathered together again with, uh, unto Hebron. And moreover in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. And so now this is where, from God's point of view, David is really king, because he's king now over all Israel, not just a couple of his loyal tribes, all 12 in effect. And uh, so this is when he really got going. We are, um, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Those are strong terms from Israel, the northern, northern group of tribes. Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king, to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. And so, again, a glib phrase that involved a conquest, which they undertook, and a, a Jebus, which becomes Jerusalem, is midway between. Ju See, it's actually, Jerusalem is really not in Judah. It's on the, on the border. It's actually in, in Benjamin. But this is a good choice because it's, it's a compromise between the north and the south in a, in a tribal sense. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zuriah, went first up and was chief. Zuriah is a half-sister of, uh, of uh, David. And David dwelt in the castle, therefore they called it the city of David. Let's talk a little bit about geography. There's Mount Moriah going vertically here on the chart, if you will. And the, the, the outlines there are the walls that Solomon was later going to build. North is to the top in this little sketch. Mount Zion is on the west side. And Mount of Olives on the east side. There's valleys. There's a ridge going up between them. The ridge between Mount Zion and this ridge is called the Teropian Valley. It's been filled in since. T between this ridge and to the eastern side, Mount of Olives, is the Kidron Valley. So if you visualize three, three ridges, if you will, Mount Zion, Mount of Olives on the extreme with a ridge up between them, you get the picture with the Hinnom Valley going along the south. Let me show you this on a topological map, which is a little more descriptive. So, oh, by the way, City of David is in the southern tip of it, also called Ophel there. And uh, uh, later on, David will buy the area that later becomes the temple. And uh, this is an area where it's difficult to separate Jewish traditions from actual facts it's because they have beliefs about this that are not necessarily correct. But there's a Gihon spring that's a source of water that was outside the wall. So Hezekiah, in his day, builds this uh, tunnel that goes to the Pool of Siloam to provide the water within the city. 
And that's one of the things you want to do when you're in Israel if you want to go knee deep in water to go through the Hezekiah's tunnel. But in any case, here's the here's a topo map. The lines represent 10 meter segments, and uh, we have Mount Zion, the high part on the west side there, and Mount of Olives, the high point on the east side, and there's a ridge system up the center. And uh, obviously, the Kidron Valley is the valley between that ridge system, Mount of Olives, to the east, and the Tropian Valley is the valley between the ridge system and uh, Mount Zion, and the Hinnom Valley is at the south. So that's a rough picture of the topography, okay? Now, Salem is the southern part. This is where in Genesis 14, Melchizedek is encountered and so forth. A place called Salem, and here it's now run by the Jebusites, and, and, and David conquers it from the Jebusites. Later on, he's going to purchase, going uphill up near the top, but at the top, there's a saddleback up there that's a thrashing floor, and he purchases that, purchases that thrashing floor and that will later become the site of the temple. Now, there's a Jewish tradition that's also Abram offered Isaac for a number of reasons. I suspect he did it at the top of the hill, not halfway up. When you get to the top of the hill, at the peak, there's a place called Golgotha. And uh, it starts, the, the ridge starts about 600 meters above sea level at the south, climbs to about 741 meters above sea level at the, temp, at the thrashing floor, but it continues up to 777, strangely. Uh, at Golgotha. I don't make anything of the numbers. People like the 777. Oh, isn't that exciting? Well, that's an artifact of the measuring system. But, uh, and, uh, but as, the, as, as the custodian of the garden tomb often points out, if God wanted us on the metric system, he would have had 10 disciples. See? <laughs> so there's, the, there's a blow up of that particular segment. Okay, let's continue. First Chronicles 11, 8 verse. And he built the city roundabout, even from Milo roundabout, and Joab repaired the rest of the city, the part that they tore down conquering it. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. That's a big statement. That's a big statement. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom and with all Israel, to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. We're not going to have a whole lot of details about the mighty men of David. And if you're really interested in how his army and who his heroes are, you may want to pay a lot of attention. We're going to just slip through this rather quickly. This is the number of mighty men whom David had. Jashubim, uh, an Ahachmanite, the chief of the captains, he lifted up a spear against 300 slain by him at one time. These guys were, <laughs> were pretty skilled warriors. These are the best of the best. Can you imagine with a spear killing 300 guys? That's that are not, you know, not, not willing participants here. They're fighting you, 300 of them. After him was Eliezer, son of Dodo, the Ehudite, who was one of the three mighties. These are the top three guys. He was with David at Pasdamim, and there were Philistines, and there uh, the Philistines were gathered together to battle where there was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from before the Philistines. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel, delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. So these, this is the inner circle. Joab is actually David's nephew, son of his half-sister, Zerah. Jeshubim, he's the chief of the officers. He's the, he slayed the 300 at one time. In 2 Samuel 23, it says 800 fled. And people think, well, gee, there's a discrepancy. No, 300 were killed, 500 left. <laughs> so that's, I believe, the way you resolve that issue. But it's, a, it's conjecture. And Eliezer also dis dis distinguished himself. And Shama, he's not mentioned here, but he is mentioned in 2 Samuel as part of the, the top bunch here. Now three of the 30 captains went down to the rock to David to the cave of Dullam. And the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. We're going to talk more about Rephaim later, but it's a, for this purpose, it's just a location not far from Jerusalem. And David was then in the, in, the, in the hold, and the Philistines' garrison was then at Bethlehem. Bethlehem is just south of, of Jerusalem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. In other words, Bethlehem is where the Philistines are camped. And David, in the casual remarks, yearned for just a cup of water from the well at Bethlehem is something he wanted. Well, these three guys, they break through the host of the Philistines, drew water out of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. That must have impressed him, except David would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord. He said, my God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? 
for with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. So the three mighty guys certainly delivered it, but David had the character or the, or the, uh, the, the uh, presence of mind not to take advantage of it. Anyway, Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was the chief of the three, lifting up a spear against 300. He slew them and had a name among the three, boy, I can imagine. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, but he, for he was their captain, howbeit he attained not the first three. So there's two different groups of three he's talking about here. Benaiah, the son of Jehida, the son of valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, also went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. So <laughs> this guy, these, these are the, the top guys. And uh, the, uh, the, the, he, he, he will slew, he, I think the next verse will tell you about the, uh, he slew an Egyptian that's uh, seven and a half feet high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. He went down to him with a staff and he plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. <laughs> you don't mess around with this guy. These things did Benaiah, son of Jehida, and he had a name among the three mighties and he's going to get promoted uh, uh, the, uh, by uh, uh, Solomon's going to advance him in the place of Joab later. And uh, behold, he was honorable among the 30, but attained not to the first three. David set him over his guard. And also the valiant men of the armies were Ashel, the brother of Joab, Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shemoth, the Hararite, Helez, the Pelonite, uh, Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Tekoite, Abiezer, the Antithite, uh, Maharai, the Netophathite. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing most of these, but I'll leave you to correct me when you're in the mood. Uh, Helen, the son of Baana, the Netophathite. Ethai, the son of Ribai, the, of Gibeah, that pertained to the children of Benjamin. Benai, the Pirathanite. Hurai, the brooks of Gash. Abiel, the Arbathite. Uh, Asmaveth, and the Baharumite. Eliaba, the shall. You know, you go through these names, um, and on the one hand, we can't really pronounce them right. We don't know much about them. A few of them, we have anecdotal indications that they were pretty formidable people. But it's interesting that God keeps a record. And uh, I'm among those that suspect that you are in this record. You're written in this book. I have this theory that the Bible itself is the book of life, and that your name, if you're in the book of life, is encrypted in the scriptures. And uh, every, all the research has been done on, on equidistant letter sequences, which are linear transforms. No one, to my knowledge, has really got, attacked polynomials. And uh, I'm not sure there's merit in doing that for a number of other reasons, but uh, it won't surprise me at all if we discover, strangely enough, that our names are here too, if you're serving God, if you're, in, if you're saved by Christ. I just throw that out as a thought. Anyway, the sons of Hashem, the Gizanite, Jonathan, the son of Shag, the Hararite, uh, Hayim, the son of Sekar, the Hararite, and Elaphal, the son of Ur, uh, Nefer, the Mercarathite, Ahijah, the Pelonite, uh, Hezro, the Carmelite, and Neari, the son of Esbei, Joel, the brother of Nathan, uh, Mibar, the son of Hagarai, Zelek, the Ammonite, and Nehari, the Barathite, and the armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zerai, and Ira, the Ithrite. These, these labels, by the way, are not necessarily ethnic, they're sometimes geographical. It's like saying John the Californian, if you will. So he doesn't. It's, 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 so there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality between the place names and previous people, and yet it does, it's not necessarily one for one. Anyway, Adina the son of Shiza, the Reubenite, the captain of the Reubenites, and thirty with him. Hanan the son of Makav, the Joshaphat, and the Mithanite, Uziah the Ephtherite, the Shama and Jehiel, the sons of Hothan and Ararite. And uh, who? <laughs> now, uh, before we leave the slide, though, you notice in uh, verse 41 there, Uriah the Hittite. I missed that. I wanted to catch that one because he's going to be very important in the life of David because that's Bathsheba's husband that David arranges to murder. So he's one of the mighty men. He's not just a soldier, he's one of the key guys. Jadeel, the son of Shimri, the Johad, his brother, the Tizite, Ithiel, the Mahavite, and Jeremiah, the, and, and uh, Joshaviah, the sons of Elanam, and Ithma, the Moabite, Ithiel, and Obed, and Jeziel, and Meshavite. Okay. I'm just as glad as you are that that's over. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 12. Now these are they that came to David, to Ziklag, 
while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish, and they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. So these are the insiders. They were with him in the dark days. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Benjamites were terrifying guys, if you know their history. And uh, when they say hurling stones, they don't mean with their hands. They're talking with a sling. Very skilled in that. And uh, so these guys are, are, are able with weapons. With both the right and left hand. I think that's kind of exciting. The chief was Ahizer, then Joash, the sons of Shema, and the Gibeathite, and Jeziel, and Pelet, and the sons of Asmaveth, and Beracha, and Jehu, the Antonite, and Ishmael, the Gibeonite, the mighty man among the thirty and over the thirty, and Jeremiah, the Jeziel, and Johanan, and Jezebed, and Gederathite, and Eluzai, and Jeremoth, and Belial, and Shemariah, and Shef. Attire the heart. And none of this will be on, uh, let me relax, none of this will be on the final exam. Okay, all right. Elkanah and Josiah and Jezreel and Yozer and Jezreel and the Korahites and Jola and Zebediah and the sons of Jerohakam and Gedor and of the Gadites, that's the tribe of Gad, they're separated themselves unto David unto, into the hold, into the wilderness, men of might and men of war, fit for the battle that could handle shield and buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose, or gazelles, if you will, upon the mountains. Ezra the first, Obadiah the second, Eliab the third, Mishmana the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atai the sixth, uh, Eliel the seventh, Johanan the eighth, Elzabad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, Machpaniah the eleventh. These were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, and the greatest over a thousand. These are they that went over the Jordan in the first month when it had overflown all its banks and they put to flight all them uh, of the valleys both toward the east and toward the west and there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David. And David went out to meet them and answered said unto them, If ye come peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you. But if ye come to betray me to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong in mine hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. And the Spirit came upon Amasai who was the chief of the captains, and said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. Peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thy helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. So there's a recognition among these mighty men that God's hand was on David, and they are obviously siding with him. And there fell some of Manasseh to David when he came to the Philistines against Saul to battle, but they helped them not. For the lords of the Philistines, upon advisement, sent him away, saying, He will fall to his master Saul, to the jeopardy of our heads. And as he went to Ziklag, there fell to him of Manasseh, Adna, Jozebad, Zedael, Michael, Jozebad, Elihu, and Zilthi, the captains of the thousands that were of Manasseh. And they helped David against the band of the rovers, for they were all mighty men of valor. They were captains of the host. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. And these are the numbers of the bands that ready armed to war and came to David to Hebron to turn to the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. So this is expanding his rule far beyond Hebron now. The children of Judah that bear shield and spear were 6,800 ready armed to the war. Children of Simeon, mighty men of valor for the war, 7,100. Of the children of Levi, 4,600. Of Jehida, he was the leader of the Aaronites. With him were 3,700. And Zadok, the young man, mighty of valor. And of his father's house, 20 and two captains. And of the children of Benjamin, the kindred of Saul, 3,000. And hitherto the greatest part of them kept the ward of the house of Saul. And of the children of Ephraim, 20,800. Mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers. And of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 which were expressed by name to come and to make David king. And of the children of Issachar, which, now this is a verse, by the way, verse tw uh, 32 um, uh, here, is a key verse for us in our institute. We springboard from this verse a whole, one of our three tracks in our institute. We have three basic paths of advancement. The Berean track, verse by verse study of the Bible. The Issachar track, taken from this verse, uh, and it says here, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. 
the sons of Issachar, becomes an idiom in our parlance of those that understand the times. And the second track of the three tracks is we call the Issachar track. It's our attempt to monitor and stay aware of the basic tr strategic trends on our horizon, about a dozen of them. The third track is what we call Koinonos track. Many people might just call it discipleship, but it's more than that. It's ambassadorship. Um, and so uh, that's the doing of the word, if you will. And those three tracks are like three legs on a stool as far as the institute's concerned. But we take the second track from this very verse. The children of Issachar understood, the men had an understanding of the times to know what their country had to do. Moving on, of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle expert in war with all instruments of war, 50,000, could, which could keep rank, and they were not of double heart. And Naphtali, a thousand captains with them, the shield and spear, 37,000, of the Danites, expert in war, 28,600. And uh, so, and of Asher is what fourth in the battle, expert in war, 40,000 upon the other side of the Jordan, of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe Manasseh, with all manner of instruments of war, battle, 120,000. And all these men of war that could keep rank came with perfect heart to Hebron, to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David the king. And there they were with David three days, eating and drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. So they all, show, all the tribes are represented here to show support. And uh, so this is a time of great festivity. It's also a key time of political union here. Moreover, they that were nine of them, even unto Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, brought bread on asses and on camels and mules and on oxen and meat and meal and cakes of figs and bunches of raisins and wine and oil and oxen and sheep abundantly. For there was joy in Israel. So now we get to the ark. But before we get into the ark, I want to now pop back about a century earlier. And I threw this in here because I thought we could squeeze it in. And I think it's the hum most, one of the most humorous passages in the Bible. Um, and we're just going to review. If you want to re put in your notes, just uh, uh, Samuel, for, uh, chapter four, uh, first Samuel 4 through 7 is the region. We're going to just extract some stuff here. But I think you'll get a kick out of it. We're back in 1 Samuel 5. The Philistines took the ark of God. They succeeded, they were God, and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow, <laughs> behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. That's some God they're worshiping. They took Dagon and set him up on his place again. <laughs> when they arose early in the, the morrow morning, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. This is just starting. This is just starting, gang. Hang in there. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that came to Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. They had a practice of stepping, not stepping on the threshold, from this, but let's move on. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the, them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them with several plagues, by the way. One is expressly mentioned here. And smote them with emeralds. Now, what is an emerald? Any guesses? Hemorrhoids. Yes, that, that would be our current term for it. Yes. Even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. For his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. So they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither. And so it was so after they carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had hemorrhoids in their secret parts. <laughs> their tumors or their hemorrhoids, their hemorrhoids, basically, is what the Hebrew is talking about. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. These are the five key cities of the Philistines. Each city doesn't want any part of this thing. Let's give it to the other guys. So they therefore sent the ark of God to Ekron. It came to pass as the ark of came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel. Let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not and our people. 
For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city, and the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with hemorrhoids. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. You can't draw it from this, but see, there's five key cities of the Philistines, and this goes from one to all five before it's over. Here's a map to give you a perspective of Israel. I put in red is the current Israel to give you a perspective here. And there's the Philistines along the coast. But you got Ekron, Gath, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. Those are the five cities of the Philistines, okay? And so this thing has gone from Ebenezer to Apheth, then down to the various cities at, in the... So let's get to... The, the Ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and diviners, saying, What shall we do to the Ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith ye shall send it to his place. They said, If we send away the Ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. In other words, their own priests are saying, Don't just send it empty. You, got, you better put an offering in it to appease all this. Then said they, well, what shall the trespass offering, what, what shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, five golden hemorrhoids and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. So this implies that there weren't just the hemorrhoids, there were rats, there were mice problems. And there were also hemorrhoids. So they make five golden mice, I can figure out how they did that, what I'm really curious about <laughs> is who posed for the five golden hemorrhoids. I'm not making this up. It's right here, first time six. But if you come go through this, it cracks me up. Can you picture this? Wherefore, you shall make images of your hemorrhoids <laughs> and, Im <laughs> and images of your mice that mar the land. And you shall give glory unto the God of Israel, for eventually he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. And I assume also off your secret parts, but we'll move on. <laughs> Wherefore, then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaoh hardened their hearts. When he hath wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Now therefore make a new cart, take two milk kine on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them. So they're going to dispossess these, un, these cows from their calves. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which he returned to him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of its own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote it. It was a chance that happened to us. The men did so. They took two milk kind, tied them the cart, shut up their calves at home, they laid the ark of the Lord up on the cart and the coffer with the mice and the gold and the images of their hemorrhoids. <laughs> and the kind took the straight way, took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right or the left. And the lords of Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. So it goes off back up to Beth Shemesh. And uh, at, they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. They lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they claved the wood of the ark and offered the kind a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, and therein the, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on great stone. And the men of the Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed, sacrificed the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord, for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Eshkelon one, Gath one, and Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both of the fenced cities and the country villages, even to the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000, threescore and ten. And the people lamented because the Lord has smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. So God means what he says. It says what he means. The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? They sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. So the ark then goes to um, Kiriath 
dream, and it stays there for almost a century because they, they don't know what to do with it. They don't mess with it. They're glad to get it back into Israel, but they're terrified as to what to do. So now, uh, the method of curious, Jim came, fetched up the ark of the Lord, brought it into the house of Benadab on the hill, sanctified Eliezer's son to keep the uh, ark of the Lord. It came to pass while the ark of Bodin Kiriath Jerim, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, just for that part of it, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So that's some background. As we get into chapter 13, it's almost a century later, and David is going to take the ark. David consulted the captains of the thousands, the hundreds, and with every leader. He's really popular. He's the king now. He's widely acclaimed. David said unto all the congregation of Israel, if it seemed good to you, uh, then it be of the Lord of our God. Let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also the priests and the Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all the people together from Sihor of Egypt, even to the entering of Hemeth, to bring the ark from kiriath Jerim. And David went up in all the Israel to Bala, that is to kiriath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwelt between the cherubims, that's the way it's always described, uh, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Minadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drave the chart. This is doing the right thing the wrong way. And one of the things we need to understand is God is very specific when he deals with holy things. So they mean well. They're doing the right thing, but not the right way. So David and all Israel played before God with all their might with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and cymbals and with trumpets. So this is a great time. David's king, widely acclaimed throughout the nation, the bringing up the ark. When they came to the thrashing floor of Chedon, there are a lot of thrashing floors. The thrashing floor is typically a place with what you and I would call a saddleback. It's a place that there's usually a prevailing breeze in the evening. That's where they would separate the grain. So those were prized. Uh, they were very utilitarian locations. When they came unto the thrashing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. The oxen have stumbled, so Uzzah puts up his hand to steady this to keep it from falling over. Now, this is a verse from the Torah in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. It says, When Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is set forward. After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of congregation. In other words, the Torah specifies that not only is it a Levite, it's a member of the family of Kohath that is to bear the ark on the pole. Before they get there, it will have been wrapped in, in, in the uh, tapestries. So the, the point is the instructions are very specific, and we're going to discover how specific. Because we get back to from 1 Chronicles 13, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. Whoa. Whoa. And David was displeased because the Lord hath made a breach upon Uzzah. Therefore, this place is called Perez Uzzah, the breach of Uzzah, uh, to this day. And, uh, you know, today... There are probably many people putting their hands in the Lord's work. In fact, where they shouldn't be putting them. And uh, so it's just interesting. Here, here is a man that, in effect, interfered, and God took him out of the way. David was afraid of God that day, boy, I can imagine, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? He should have asked that question before he tried. So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So that ends this session. Just a quick laying the background for what's forthcoming in a way. But uh, for the next session, of course, you want to read the next you know, four chapters, 14, 15, 16, 17. 
And you might also review 2 Samuel 5 through 7, which is what we excerpted some of this from. And uh, so with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.